IJ. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What was it like growing up in where you grew up in Pennsylvania? Monongahela. Tell me about where you grew up and what it was like uh, as a boy, just going back to the beginning. Well, I grew up in uh, Monongahela, which is a suburb of Pittsburgh, PA. Started playing piano when I was about seven years old. Then I started playing the trumpet. So I played in the band like in junior high school. And I got really interested in like we were playing all this horribly schmaltzy music. And so I just decided I was going to write my own music for the band. Uh, I didn't know how to do it. So I kept borrowing everybody else's music and seeing how it worked. And so I did. I wrote some music and the band director was nice enough to play it in the band and it turned out okay i mean there were mistakes and stuff and he finally gave me a book about how to do it it was very special because i was you know i was kind of a nerd kid i i wasn't a real good athlete or anything and but i could do stuff other kids couldn't do i could write music at 11 or something that made me kind of a freak nerd maybe but it sort of developed a little bit more started to study a lot more a lot of listening my dad was a kind of a big band aficionado he had a lot of of jazz records and I'd listen to those. And um, so I was always around music in, in the household. When I got into school, in high school, the band director encouraged me to write arrangements for the marching band. And I do remember going to see some movies. One in particular was The Creature from the Black Lagoon. And this has a kind of an interesting twist to it. Because what I didn't know at the time with those movies, although they were classic scary movies that would go to Saturday afternoon. The music kind of stuck out. I said, wow, that's that's pretty cool. And how they do that. So I started watching more movies and soundtrack. I went to college. I had a scholarship to West Virginia University to study composition. My second year of college there, my band director took me to Pittsburgh Symphony to hear uh, Henry Mancini was the guest conductor. He was uh, playing his piccolo and played piano and conducted the orchestra and played all of his hits. What was really cool is like many years later, I got to meet him. We started, we became very good friends. Interestingly enough, he was one of the composers of the music on the Creature from the Black Lagoon. In those days, uh, like Universal and many of the studios would have a multiple amount of composers participating. They say, you do reel number one and you do reel three and it was like that because they churned these things out like crazy. So that was one of his his projects. But I was able to tell him uh, when I finally met him that concert was the inspiration for me wanting to do film music. Pretty good friends. And he was in failing health at the time. But while he was able to be communicative, we talked quite a bit. He was from Aliquippa, Pennsylvania, which was just up the um, Ohio River. And I was on the Monongahela River. So we thought, well, Maybe there's something about the water, you know, that makes us be able to write music. The short version of, uh, of how I got started in this crazy business. In, re in regards to that, Jay, since you grew up so close to Pittsburgh and attended West Virginia University, that was around the time that George A. Romero made Night of the Living Dead. So my mm -hmm. question to you is, since he was a local, essentially with you, were you aware of the film at that time? Why you were going to college and did you even go see it? But, you know, I was not a real horror movie buff, but because that was local uh, and it had zombies, I felt like I got to go see that. We never met. I never met George Romero, but I did meet Tom Savini. Who, so he was the special effects guy and an actor in, in Mania. Now, I believe that Monongahela, it's famous for the Aquatorium, which oh, yes. I read is the first concert venue of its kind in the U.S. Have you ever got a chance to perform there? I did perform there two summers ago. They had their big, they invited me to become I was the guest conductor, a symphony orchestra that played at the Aquatorium. When I was a, in high school, my high school, I had my own little band in high school. The Aquatorium wasn't built yet, but it was in the, the parking lot where they would have the fair and everything. And we played there on a stage. The Aquatorium is very cool because they, at one point, they had something called the American Wind Symphony that was a, on a barge in Pittsburgh. And they would go up and down the river and pull into these towns and do these free concerts. The Aquatorium was one of those places. And, uh, but it's a beautiful stage with bleachers with made in the shape of an American flag and big stage. So we had about a 65 piece orchestra that I conducted the orchestra at the Aquatorium two years ago. Was that show during the day or night? It was nighttime. It was kind of funny because the Aquatorium is on one side of the, um, railroad track so every time a train would come through they would blow their whistle and it usually was not in the same key as the piece of music we were playing so we sort of have to stop because this was a pretty 
much bigger concert than what they normally did. They weren't quite prepared for all the power they needed because it was at nighttime. The mu musicians had music stands with lights on them. <clears throat> when the, they were shooting, they had video going on, they had drones, it was a big deal. But every time the power got a little bit too strong, all the lights went out on the music stands. <laughs> so pretty soon, like the guys on one stand were holding up their phones so the other guys could read the music. And it, it was a crazy, crazy evening. But it came off okay. And uh, we were planning on doing it again, of course, last summer. But that was a COVID summer. So that, that didn't happen. And who, we're not sure what's going to happen later this summer or fall with uh, other concerts there. But it was it's a pretty big deal for the town and uh, sort of helped put the town culturally on the map a little bit more. Talk a little bit about being drafted into the military while you were working on your graduate degree. I'm guessing by just common sense, that had to be around the time of Vietnam, I'm assuming. Yes. What was it like going into the Navy? I believe it was the Navy, right? Please tell us about how you became the chief arranger and composer. I myself am a military veteran. I did four years active duty in the U.S. Army and two years reserve. Well, that was during the Vietnam War. And because I came from such a small town, almost every available 18-year-old, 18 to 20-year-olds in my town were drafted. But I was able to get a deferment to finish my degree. And I started working on my master's degree at the university. I was also teaching public school. I was also a assist, graduate assistant with a band writing music for the band. I still got drafted. I even took the draft physical. I mean, I, and I passed it, but I was not really keen on, because I was a um, ROTC person and I would most likely and go to Vietnam as a forward observer. And I had several fraternity brothers come home in body bags. I wasn't looking forward to this. So it turns out that my band director at the university had been in the Navy band during the Korean conflict. I went to see him. I said, look, I, I'm drafted. I can't do the band this year. And I said, I'm not really excited about doing the army thing. And he says, well, let me make a couple calls. And he called the Navy band in Washington where he was attached also. And it turns out they had an opening for a writer. You need to go down there right away and take your music and audition before the army gets you because after that you're you're gone. I went down and they liked my music and they said, that's great. I'll go take a physical and go into the Navy. Well, I couldn't, I didn't pass the Navy physical. It was very <laughs> bizarre. I was good enough for the army to be a target but I wasn't good enough to be a composer. Went back and took the physical again the next day and I passed it. I went off to uh, Great Lakes Naval Training Center and I couldn't tell the people there that I was gonna go into the band because I would immediately outrank all of the people who were pushing me through boot camp. I was gonna come out as an E6 and they were not quite to that level. So I had to play the game and, and because I did well, you know how they give you batteries of tests to see what they want you to do. I did well in the hearing test, so they thought I would be a great sonar guy on a submarine. They started setting me up to go to submarine school. First thing they did is pull all the metal fillings out of my teeth. Why would a guy with metal fillings in a submarine make any difference? You're in a metal submarine, but apparently you had to put plastic fillings in your teeth. And they did it then with slow moving cable driven drills with no Novocaine. And, yeah, it was like uh, Papillon, the scene in there. It was anyway. I had my my orders that were tucked in my my private little box in the in the barracks, and so when we came time to get our orders, and we all go to the order place. Everybody's getting shipped out here and there, and I, they never called my name, so I was getting kind of worried. Finally, I went to see the. I asked if I could see the head person. They said, well, we don't have your orders. I said, well, I have them here. They're in my pocket. So I gave him my, my orders. He said, oh, you're, going to, <laughs> you're going to DC, huh? I said, yes, sir, I am. He says, okay, well, you get on that bus and off you go. Went into the Navy band. And at that time, of course, it was during Vietnam. We had one of the best collections of musicians in the world because everybody's getting drafted. It was a choice duty station because it was not a transferable billet. It was like once you were assigned there, you stayed there for four years. At first we had, um, there were four arrangers, music arrangers, and we all worked in the same room, a, a room about 10 by 12. And we all had um, Steinway upright battleship gray pianos that we played and everybody's plunking around trying to write music. And it was pretty, pretty tough, but it was definitely better than doing other things. So finally my four years were up and I, um, we were getting a new 
a leader of the band. He was the leader at the U.S. Naval Academy at the time. So he called me up and said, well, you're about to get out, but are you, could we talk you into staying in the band? I'd like you to be, sort of help turn the image of the band around, maybe make it more like the Boston Pops and, and get a different audience coming to the concert. And I said, well, I, I could do that. And so we made some deals and I got a re-enlistment bonus. My other part of the deal was, well, I became an avid sailor and he was at the Naval Academy. And I said, well, Maybe I could take classes at the academy. And he said, that's no problem. So he, he fixed that up for me. And so he became the leader and I became his chief arranger. In addition to arranging and composing, I also got to do music for the Navy training film. What you do on shore leave or what you don't do on shore leave. Right? And very educational thing. I mean, every week they did a film. Uh, it was Admiral Zumwalt who was the chief of naval operations. He had these things called z -grams. So every... Every week there was a little movie, and so they wanted the Navy band to play the music, so I, I wrote it. So I kind of learned a little bit about film writing. For, I re-enlisted for four years, so I was going to do, I was thinking about keeping it permanent, but I started to become more interested in seeing what else was available outside of the military, and I sort of started working my way into going to New York City a lot more, and meeting jazz musicians, and a couple of the guys that were in the Navy with me ended up going out on the road with a trumpeter, Maynard Ferguson, famous wow. jazz. They told Maynard that Maynard wanted somebody new to write some music for them. I was still in the Navy and they said, well, we know a great rager. Why don't you check out his stuff? Maynard actually called me and being a trumpet player, I, I was, he was my idol. You know, he, he played with Stan Kenton and he was a brilliant high note trumpet player. He says, yeah, I'm going to do an album in New York and I'd like some new music. And so I wrote some tunes for him and he liked them, recorded them. Uh, next thing I know, Maynard is recording some of my charts in New York City with his band at, at CBS. Another producer, uh, Bob James, who famous piano player, was on staff at Columbia. It was time for Maynard to do his next album. Uh, Maynard insisted that I write his album and that I become his producer. So I didn't know what a producer did. I thought maybe you arranged the chairs or, you know, I don't know what. I was hired by Columbia, CBS Records my last year of my Navy contract, I was able to do what's called Operation Transition. So I still stayed in the Navy. I had to still write music for the Navy. Freelance, I could do it else. I, and I moved to Connecticut while I was in the DC band. It was an awesome experience. And my first album to produce was was Maynard, with, was Maynard. So he knew me and we talked a lot about what kind of music to do. And so we had the album finished and it was pretty cool. The album was called Conquistador. Seven maybe? Well, we can answer that by knowing that when this movie came out because the album was ready to be released. And one of the executives at Columbia said, hey, Jay, we went to see this movie the other night, the theme from it, and we thought it might be right for for one of your artists. So why don't you go check it out and see what you think? So I went to see the movie. It was this, it wasn't a big hit movie. It was a sleeper movie about a boxer with Sylvester Stallone. I hear the movie, I hear the music and the music's pretty cool, kind of slow, wasn't very jazzy, but I thought, you know, I could jazz that up a little bit. And this is kind of when disco and dance music is starting to get hot. So I bet I could make that danceable. I talked to the to Mandarin and to Columbia, said, yeah, go in and cut a single on the record and see what you think. So I did. Well, I got all the great pop musicians to play. I did the arrangement. Flies in. He hears the track. He warms up in the studio. We recorded this warm up, which was fantastic. The rest is kind of history because it was the theme from Rocky. It was the hit version of the theme from Rocky. So now we have this dilemma. We got this album finished, but Rocky's not on it. We had to relinquish one of the cuts. We did put Rocky, obviously, on the on the record, and the record became a gold record. Uh, now, instead of playing these little jazz rooms, he's playing like Yankee Stadium now. I mean, he's a big deal, right? Interestingly enough, the segue to film and Maniac, um, Joe Spinell, who was the star and part writer of Maniac, was actually in Rocky. Did you ever have a plan to go back to Pennsylvania after military? No, not really. Although I did go back quite a bit. I, I had family there. But no, I was, I'm was i in New York City now. So it's like, <laughs> so yeah, I, I got the record education. I was working at Columbia Records on 51 West 52nd. I had an office in that building. In the process, while I was at Columbia, a particular interesting saxophone player came along and asked me if I would help him do what I did for Maynard. And it's Gato Barbieri who wrote the music to Last Tango in Paris. So I get this call from Gato and he says, ah, and he's from Argentina and he speaks in a very strange 
accent, half Italian, half Spanish. He said, oh, I, I want you to do an album with me. And he was on A&M Records and Herb Alpert was producing. So we went in and cut um, an album with, with Gatto. Sure enough, we had a hit record. Album Europa is the title, was the song that became the hit. And it was this Carlos Santana called Europa, which we covered, became a hit single. Album sold 700,000 records. Now Gatto is doing great. So great that four other albums with him. In the process, he gets asked to compose a score to another film. None other than Michael Winner. And this is the movie Firepower with Sophie Loren and James Coburn. When Gatto did Last Tango with Bertolucci, he didn't really score the movie per se. He just wrote this beautiful theme. They played it over and over again. And and Bertolucci cut the Gato's music was finished before they shot the movie. Bertolucci could listen to that music and shoot his scenes while he's listening to the music. So that's why it worked so well. However, in this film, the Firepower film, it was already cut and finished. And Gato didn't have a clue as to how to make that work. Neither, nor did I actually, but I had had some experience with the Navy and I'd done some commercials and stuff. And he says, you know, we work together well. How about I write these themes and you orchestrate and make everything fit the film for me. And we'll go off to London and record with the London Philharmonic. That's what we did. So Firepower was my first film really that I was involved because I was the orchestrator, arranger, scorer, conductor. So my first big attraction there was walking into the studio with about 70 musicians, Sophia Loren up on the big screen. So how could you not get hooked by that? The film, yeah, it was sort of a, I think they called it a payday film where all these actors got to go to some lush island in the Caribbean <clears throat> and run around and it's like a jewel heist and all that sort of stuff. O.J. Simpson was in the movie. Oh, geez. He got blown up in the Real nine, I think. What would kind of shock me and probably other people is going from a 70-piece orchestra with a movie with those folks that you mentioned to a really sleazy, gritty, grimy, gory, nasty horror film that I think was shot on 16 millimeter in New York City. And by the way, when I say that, I say that with fondness because I think it's great that someone that could be working on up say here would go and I don't mean to do it in terms of quality of the mo and product but in terms of money and stuff down here right. I think that's amazing that you would even consider it and then you would be part of it and you did such an amazing job with it so talk about how that all came together from where you were at right before I left to go to London to, to conduct the London Philharmonic the producer of the film uh, Andy Garoni he and his brother produced uh, jazz concerts in, in New York, among other things. They came to me at Columbia and asked if I had any artists that he might be able to ask for their movie they were making. He didn't so tell me much about the movie. I was kind of floating. I was on my way to London to do a big movie. I said, well, I'm really interested in doing movies, but what, as soon as I get back, why don't we talk and see what happens? So I came back and I started thinking about who on our, we had a roster at one time, the jazz roster had, we probably had 70% of the top selling artists on, on our roster. And so I was sort of in charge of that. And I thought, yeah, there's a lot of guys there that could do this and Herbie Hancock and everybody. And, but I said, you know, I'm really interested in scoring movies and with my own music, my way, my music. I talked to Andy and he said, well, come, you have to come down to meet Bill. He's, he's the director and see what you think. As I said, I'm not a big horror. I, I didn't see any of the kind of horror movies that were being made in the eighties at that point, like Halloween and other John Carpenter films. So I get down to meet Bill and these guys, their enthusiasm was completely infected. They were like, oh, look, we're going to blow this guy's brains out. Look at this. This is so cool. Oh, man. Look at, look. Oh, we got to set this shot. Up. And they were still making the movie and it, some of it was being edited. They'd edit a little bit at a time. I mean, they were scavenging to make this movie. It was very low budget and they were sneaking around shooting scenes without permit. You know, I'm not sure that everybody knows how they got it done. But they got it done. I had so much appreciation for their energy and their enthusiasm. And Bill wasn't sure. I mean, I don't know if you know much of the history of how this was supposed to happen, but... No, go ahead. Please tell us. But anyway, Bill was pretty tight with uh, Dario Argento. Dario and, Ar 
and his Italian company was going to help pay for some of this film. And his wife was going to be in the film instead of Carolyn Monroe, I believe. Goblin was going to do the music because he had an association with Goblin. But, but somehow it all kind of, and now Bill is like scraping money up from wh wherever he found it. I have no idea. It didn't all certainly go into the music budget. I can tell you that. But, um, but he got it done. And now he says, well, you know, I don't know how about you doing the music because you, you know, you're kind of a jazz guy. And I said, well, yeah, but I have done, I think I know what I'm doing. But we talked a lot and I went to his apartment and we watched movie after movie and he would show me, I mean, he wasn't a musician. He couldn't really talk music. He talked about what he thought was working in films that he was fond of and what didn't work. And, and so we discussed, we had a dialogue going basically of how he envisioned his film to be scored. So I said, well, let me just do it, you know? And he said, okay. In those days, we didn't have, I'm gonna really date myself here, but w there were no video uh, cassettes or video players or anything. The only way to reference the film is to go to the editing room, watch it on, a, it was in 16 or maybe Super 16, I'm not sure what it was shot on, uh, on a movieola, an upright movieola, and like with a click, 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 click going on all the time. And I'd take notes about, what's going on in the film, and then try to sequence the music. I mean, we didn't have a picture to look at, so I had to do it all from memory. And I'd come in like maybe three times a week and then have a little bit more cut, and then I would go home and start sketching some things. And, and then we discussed the, the budget, which was very low. And I said, well, I'm kind of used to having a symphony orchestra. <laughs> well, that's not <laughs> what happened today, so. Uh, so try to figure out how you can make it really different with what resources you have. I was experimenting a lot with electronics. I had some early electronic music instruments and I had some friends who were totally into this. I started thinking of how to do it. I said, I, I think I can figure this out and you can come and be a part of it because it's all going to be done up in, I lived in Connecticut at the time. There was a little studio not too far away. Bill came and he lived with me for a little bit and would come to the couple sessions. Once he saw the process, oh man, this is, this is awesome. So then he kind of let me alone and we didn't really, he sort of gave me some notes, but as, as he said, um, I should put this in our talk. Um, my wife is doing a biography of me and she interviewed every, all these people and she interviewed Bill. They said, well, yeah, I gave him a bunch of stuff to do and he didn't listen to any of it, but what he came up with was so much better. So, uh, but one thing he did do, he made me very aware of, um, Ennio Morricone. We all know Ennio's music, but he did so many really inexpensive, like Italian spaghetti westerns and stuff like that without, you know, some of like two guitars. I mean, there was like not, no resources at all. His early works were very minimalist and very effective. So I said, well, you know what? If, if they mix this right and we have music that's really different, it should be pretty profound. And and so the more I watched this movie, the more as it progressed, the more I sort of started thinking that maybe to play against the horror, find some sort of pathos for this warped guy who was mistreated by his mother and all that, it would be a real departure from what normal horror music scores would be like. I am kind of a melody writer to begin with because I was doing records and songs and stuff. So I decided to take that approach and wrote but instead of it being, take the accompaniment out of it, theme that's played A by the um, wooden recorder, and then later by the fretless bass, it's very a tonal piece of music. But what's not tonal is the accompaniment. It's very warped. The accompaniment is like, you would not normally accompany a tonal melody with that kind of discordant um, harmony. And to hear it together, you hear the uh, acoustic instruments play this, kind of pretty melancholy theme, but then these weird electronic uh, affected keyboards and stuff are playing the background around it that's just kind of strange. It's just, this guy's pretty twisted, but he's got, he, he's got a heart, you know, he feels like I you have to feel sorry for him. So that's and, kind of how the theme came about. And, and, and you know, I, I got to say that I think that was really smart because sometimes you see horror films and I'm a horror film fanatic. I've been watching them you can tell by my shirt, right? Okay. All my whole life, you know, over 50 years now. Sometimes I think scores for movies can be too one note. They'll just be scary and just be dark. 
And in fact, if I remember John Carpenter's story about the fog, he said when he scored it the first time, the movie didn't work. So he had to actually go reshoot some stuff. But also in terms of the score, he brought in that lighter, pretty stuff, mm -hmm. which gave it a balance. Yes. And I, I, and I think it's just like anything. You can't, you've got to have something to contrast both sides or else you don't see one side as impactful as it should. By the way, I, I should tell you a story related to the movie that you made and just to give you a, you know, a little break or whatever. I saw Maniac in high school. I'm gonna guess it must have been 82, 83. Mm -hmm. I think VHS came out popular wise, probably 81. I didn't yeah. have a player. I had a friend that had a player. Okay. So we, now at that time, I was a horror film fanatic. Mm -hmm. And Tom Savini had captured my attention with Dawn of the Dead and Friday 13th, The Burning, The Prowler, etc. So when we heard that he did this movie, or when I heard he did this movie, I wanted to rent it. So my friend rented it at his house, which is actually, he lived in a, a trailer house. Uh -huh. And I, I actually think that it's, it wasn't like a, a decrepit looking house, but you know, a trailer park's different than say a regular house. So right. I, I think that kind of played a little bit into the move, the atmosphere of the movie as well. Sure. So so we sit down. I can remember like exactly the living room right now in my head. And at the time, I had never seen many VHF at all. So we watched the movie. And I thought out of all the gore films, now I, I'm saying that to give it a label, even though I don't say that in a great degrading manner. Uh -huh. I'm saying, you know, just like, you know, you've got hard rock, heavy metal, classic metal, thrash metal. In horror films, you've got different kinds of horror films. Yeah. Slashers, you know, suspense, demonic, whatever. Between Tom Savini's explosive makeup effect, your atmospheric score, those New York City gritty locations, right. probably that they didn't have a lot of money, which I think in this case, it worked for the movie. It didn't look too glitzy and pretty. Mm -hmm. It was right. the way it was. And when you put all those degrees together, and I, I think even Bill Lustig's direction, I think it was very underrated because you could tell, I could tell, especially now, that he was a guy who had watched a lot of movies. Oh, yeah. And he had picked up certain things, whether it was a certain shop from Chainsaw or Argento, you could see this guy had picked up some things that he was inspired by in a positive way. It just, it left a really lasting impact on me. It's one of those movies when you saw it, you just couldn't forget it. Like to me, so many Hollywood movies today, you watch it, you may not even remember the name. Right. When you watch it on Netflix or in the theater, because they're so commonplace, they're all kind of over glitzed. They're kind of all whitewashed, politically correct. There's nothing really to them that stands out. But when you go back to what you guys did with Maniac, you guys was as a down and dirty, gritty, nasty horror film that delivered what it was supposed to do. So I really commend you guys for doing that. Um, I've seen a lot more movies since then. It had more blood, actually, mm -hmm. but didn't impact me the same. And why do you suppose that that was? I, I think it's a combination of what I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe not the movie maybe not had a location like Brooklyn and New York City like we saw in Maniac. It might not have had as good a music like you created. And and by the way, what I mean particular with your music, and I'll we'll get really specific about some of the cues and stuff. Okay. But somehow your music not just gave it a, a balance of the psychological aspect of the killer or the maniac, Frank mm -hmm. Zito. But I don't know how you did it, but you captured, and you might not, you might have done it unintentionally, but you captured the feel of New York. Now, you, New York might be even different. I lived in New York 30 years now, right. but I know what New York City feels like. Mm -hmm. And I can remember what it felt like back then in the movies that I would see. And, and, and what I liked so much in particular was the way you would take like those droning, synthesizers mm -hmm. and give it like this bottom register and then you would augment it with with, with not just the uh, wooden recorder but i believe there was clarinet the fretless bass piano maybe different keys of 
keyboard parts. You gave it all these things that made it feel like I was there in that place. Yeah. And I, I don't think that's common, especially today. Today, a lot of the scores I hear are almost, you can't tell the difference between sound effects yes. and score. It's, it's almost like there's no melody. You had melody. You mm -hmm. also had that dark deepness to it. Right. I, I, I just, and then, and then truthfully, a lot of the directors today, they're not as good as even Bill was back then because they're all shooting movies the same way with the same subject matter. This one, they were not afraid to go after it and like kick you in the balls. Exactly. Well, you you hit it right on the head with, with what's wrong with so many of the scores and the movies now. And a lot of it is because the filmmaking has become so corporate. Somebody will shoot their film and now that music, the editors on the films keep a complete collection of all the scores of all the films being made. So they'll put a temp track against that, that film and they'll refine the temp track. Oh, this might be a little bit better. Let's put this cue in here. Let's try this. Then they keep playing that for the, um, for the production company and the producers start falling in love with that sound. Oh, let's now we're gonna hire a composer. Now we want you to make it sound just like these 12 scores that have been amalgamated or homogenized into this one sort of generic action piece, but don't do it too close because we don't want to get sued. So then he or she comes up with a score that just might tweak that a little bit, and but not really. It's sort of like I'm taking the best of and making it fit without getting arrested. So it's sort of a, a and not just the music, the sound effects, the, the, the shooting angles, a lot of it, like Bill and company were really adventurous in what they did. And I don't see a lot of that. Obviously the CGI stuff is, is so much more advanced now. Um, your comments about New York, I walked those streets in New York when, when 42nd Street looked like that. One of Bill's favorite comments was, we got some pretty uh, horrible reviews from the New York newspapers, the Times and the Post and all that. And Bill says, you know, people come see my movies don't really care what the reviews say because they're sleeping under the newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that he didn't really care. He says, well, but then I read it prior to us meeting tonight, I was really loved. This film is like rated, like of all the 80s horror films, it's like right up there, you know? And the music was right up there. And so this is pretty cool. At the time, we didn't know. I mean, we were just taking a shot, you know, and reaching out and not trying to sound like anybody else. So I think we succeeded. And, and, you, and you know what, Jay? Um, I mean, look, I've, I've not just been a filmmaker for 30 years, but I've been writing as a journalist, kind of like this is video journalism, right? So mm -hmm. so I've been doing that for over 30 years. And I've read thousands of reviews. And, and the one thing that I've come to realize is when you look at a critic, you almost have to look at who are they? What do mm -hmm. they like? What made them a critic? What qualifies them as right. a, a journalist or a critic? And I think today, most of them have no credibility, if any. So mm -hmm. you've got to think about who is it that's watching the movie? They may not be the one you'd even try to make the movie for. So I remember Bob Clark that made Children Shouldn't Play with Dead Things and Black Christmas and Murder by Decree, Porky's. Mm -hmm. He said, Critics need to be educated about the movies they're watching because they don't always understand them, right? Right. right. Yes. So yeah. I'm 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 glad that you guys hopefully felt some sort of validation over the years for what you guys did, because it really didn't matter what those critics thought back then in New York. The people right. that love your movie now, they're the real people that support it. Well, it's become quite the cult classic. I'm not sure exactly why it happens that way. I'm really glad it did. I mean, there's, I think there's at least seven or eight, maybe more soundtrack album releases from this. I don't know if you have the red vinyl album in the shape of Joe Spinell's head. Do I don't, that? I would look that, that's cool. <laughs> I have it, but I've never opened it to play it. So it was, it was just kind of freaky looking. It was amazing uh, to have worked on this and then to go to the screening in New York City and watch people's reaction, the audience reaction to it and the way it was mixed, 
it was one of the first, I think, Dolby surround films for its time. I'm not sure if that's exactly accurate. You'd have to research that, I think. It was really, if you listen in, in um, really good stereo, you'll hear amazing separation between left and right in the, in the score. And Bill actually played the score way loud, louder than most people do these, these days. You know, we cut through the sound effects, well, except for the brains being blown out and stuff. But um, it was, it was like, and we also didn't try to compete. When there, was a, when there was a moment that was a sound effect moment, if you notice, the music would kind of lay back um, and let the sound, sound come through. Like the subway chase, for example, I don't know how detailed you want to get with all this stuff. oh yeah yeah i'm very much into it but yeah like when you're the when the nurse girl is in the subway platform the music kind of calms down so you hear just a little bit of it but you can hear the subway you know train and stuff and then when uh she's pursued bill pulls back the sound of the, the you know the subway and then the restroom and the subway and all that and then it's all music so otherwise People now don't know how to do that. I mean, they probably do, but when you go to a big film mix now, you've got like 20 sound mixers and one music mixer. And so the sound guys are all pushing their faders up, up, up. You know? <laughs> Music's like, oh my gosh, where's the music? You know, the sound isn't gonna really sell the whole thing like, like the music can. So uh, in that way, uh, Bill listened a lot to, the reason the Morricone scores work so well is that they, you could hear them. Yeah. You know, he did yeah. a score with harmonica and guitar, and it's like in your face, and there's horses and stuff running around, but you don't hear the horses. You hear the you hear the music, so it was it's beautiful. I I bought the Versi Saraband soundtrack of your score for Maniac shortly after seeing the movie, back in like I said late '82, right. early '83, and I bought it at Tower Records location in downtown Seattle. There were a couple. Tower Records. I grew up okay. in Seattle, so that's, I'm from the West Coast. I think it's really cool. A music can seal memories of time and space. I mean, it mm -hmm. does it in movies and it does it in life. In other words, in my head, like right now, I can actually see the inside of Tower Records where I walked over to the northwest corner. There was a window with the space needle sticking up. It was right about when the sun was going down. I didn't know exactly where it was. Obviously, it makes sense. It was probably alphabetically. But I pull up the Maniac score, which I was looking for. It was the LP. It was the record. I bought it. I just think it's amazing how music can do that. It can yeah. trap memories. And like just me buying that score. Well, you know, it's a fascinating uh, study. When people get older and there's some sort of dementia or uh, Alzheimer's or that sort of thing, Music is one of the last things that go in in your brain. Like people might forget people's names and their relatives' names, but they can remember a song and what happened to them when they heard that song like 50, 60 years ago. Something that's more, I don't know what the correct word is about how music affects the brain and how our memory is tied into that. It's very spiritual in a way. So it's Fascinating that you, you could do that. One thing I didn't mention, and it might, it might have to do with the fact that I didn't have a crutch like a videotape to watch the movie. I sort of had to just remember it and score the movie based on my memory. In later times, I actually, if I see a film before it has music in it, I hear the music already written. It's my music. The problem is writing it down, you know, like how do you get all that music written down in like 90 minutes of music? I don't know. It's just a gift that I that I have and I'm grateful for it. So I know you've created a lot of music over your career, especially for TV Star Trek related. Um, I know that's been very successful for you, which is great. The first track, the main title, the Maniac's theme, did you record or insert that ticking clock and the sound of the seagulls, you know, crying out in the ocean environment? Or did you just take those from the sound effects to put it in your soundtrack? The ticking thing was like from the binocular optical, like when you put a quarter in yep. and you're looking through, the guy's looking through the binoculars and that's the time thing ticking down. 
when I saw the film, of course, it didn't have any music in it. It did have Joe moaning and groaning, and it had the ticking thing in it, and you could hear the surf. But when we decided to do the the uh, soundtrack album, we said, no, we got, we got to have all that in there because it's all part of the, the uh, texture. I mean, yes, we could just have the theme, but it was a, a collaborative uh, effort to have the sound, Joe Spinell's voice, the ocean, and have the theme there, you know? So um, I, I played this movie for, um, I, I do some teaching and the young man, 15 years old, says, wow, you, you killed people off in the first five minutes of the movie. <laughs> he was pretty impressed by that. So I don't know, maybe there's a scale of how long it takes to, to slash people's throats or something. I'm not sure, but he, he was very impressed with that. More so than the music, but that, that's okay. So here's something I've always been curious of ever since I've seen the movie and also the many times I've listened to it since I first got that score. Did you play, perform the recorder? I know you must have probably done the keyboard parts. Like how much of that, that the performances of what we hear was actually you? And that's not to discredit you for any reason. I'm just curious, did you perform any of the stuff yourself? or strictly wrote it and composed, uh, conducted it? No, it was a combination. I play, well, I played a lot of the piano parts. One other keyboard player, Peter Levin is his name, famous jazz keyboard player. He and Tony Levin play as a duo all the time. Uh, Gordon Johnson played the bass, and he's a very famous bass player. George Marge, one of the top New York studio woodwind players, played the recorder. Percussion was a young man who built his own percussion instruments, sort of built this cage and he inside the studio and he has all these cymbals and exotic instruments and stuff. And you have to remember, when we recorded this score, there was nothing like MIDI or any way to synchronize instruments. Like the synthesizers were all monophonic, one note at a time. Uh, that was a mini Moog and a Prophet and an ARP 2600, they were all mono instruments. So if you wanted a chord, you had to track it three times to get a chord. And, and, the, and you had to do it in one place? Or like today, everybody's got their computers at home, but well, back then you had to go to one place. We didn't have computers at home, <laughs> okay? So no, we brought our uh, instruments to this recording studio and we had a big analog tape machine, 24 tracks. We would record one note at a time into the into the machine, play it back, add another note, play it back, play some more stuff. The only instrument that could play chords was the uh, an instrument called a Mellotron, which was a, a real Rube Goldberg type device that you could play like the string, it sounded like strings or voices. Um, you could play a chord, it's like a piano. Only the way it worked, there were tape, there were strips of pre-recorded like strings or vocals or whatever and it could only last like five seconds and then you'd have to you'd hold a chord down and you get five seconds you have to overlap it to get an, another one so it was pretty archaic but that in a way was how some of those sounds got to be so cool because we realized one thing about the recording that way for example if you play a cymbal like a cymbal roll or, or maybe you scrape a cymbal or something. It's one sound, one, one pitch. But if you record that instrument and alter the speed of the tape recorder, it sounds as though that instrument is capable of bending the pitch. So like if you want to have a cymbal that goes like that, well, when you record it, you turn the speed up so therefore, when you play it back, it sounds like it's descending. There's a, a lot of stuff that we did, especially with piano. Like if you play acoustic piano, which can play more than one note at a time, but then adjust the speed that you record it, suddenly sounds like the piano is some kind of hell bent for uh, dissonance because you're, you're changing the pitch while you're recording. So for stuff like that and percussion instruments, it just makes this very ethereal, sound that's just like nothing you've heard before <laughs> what inspired you to use the fretless bass because it's so identifiable in this score i mean in my mind and maybe it was used a lot more in movies before yours which i can't remember hearing it so much but i know that 12 years after your movie the late james horner 
used it for a score for unlawful entry with Ray Liotta and Kurt Russell. I think you, you really, you hear it in the first Maniac theme, it's there, but you really hear it in that second cue, Apocalypse New York. Speaking of the second track, that distorted, choppy, synthesized part that almost sounds like a helicopter, that was really cool because you put that kind of over the bass and the drone. Was that intentional to sound like a helicopter? Because I think you cut to an aerial shot of Manhattan. Yeah, I guess it was sort of to reference that, but it was done all electronically. That was a, um, a Prophet 5 synthesizer, which could actually make that sound just by pressing a button. There's a thing called an arpeggiator, which repeat the sound very close together. So otherwise, you couldn't physically play chicka -chicka 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 like that on the keyboard. Part of the electronics of weighing using waveforms to control other waveforms, you could make things happen that way. And you're you're using what's called a filtering, it's analog synthesis, but you're using a filter device to open and close the filter, which causes that to sound l like a helicopter. So that's very astute that you could there, th notice that, but it did happen to go well with the helicopter overhead. The fretless bass, I, ha I had a budget that I could afford three people to play on the score. The woodwind player, the percussionist, myself, of course, which was not a paid person, a, a keyboard, the bass player. The bass player happened to be a friend of mine, and he happened to play bass with, with Maynard Ferguson, and uh, Gordon Johnson was the bass player. He was an outstanding bass player. I just thought because we're kind of taking traditional melodies and bending them, like the whole score is kind of bent, I guess you could say, because <laughs> uh, the guy was bent, right? Yes. Maybe, so Gordon was the guy and he could, on a fretless bass, you don't have frets. And so you can bend it to any level you want. And in addition to just playing the melody, there were times when it's improvised, when he could just constantly be playing uh, really cool melodic ideas, but then bending them internally without us having to manipulate you know, the tape machine and stuff. So he would hear a sort of a bent track and he could play a, a regular pitch on it and it would sort of lock it in just like it did with the woodwind. The woodwind's playing regular notes, but the accompaniment is like a whole different set of intonation. It's like, wow, that's, what is that? I mean, many people ask, you know, technically, how did you make those sounds? And especially the, the what Bill called the stingers, or the popcorn spillers. And this is what's fascinating about scoring horror films. It's the ultimate manipulation. But as a composer, and it's really fun to go to the theater and watch people spill their popcorn <laughs> uh, based on not so much what you play with the music, but where you play it. When you're watching a film, you have a little bit of leeway in terms of, we'll talk in film frames now, like maybe three to four frames after something happens, the music can react to that, and it seems kind of normal. You can tell when, when it's out of sync, when you hear somebody talking, if it's like five frames out of sync, your eye can sort of envision that it's not in sync anymore. But with, with stingers, you anticipate the action. You have, all of a sudden, you're going to have a knife come in from the right-hand side of the screen. Instead of waiting till you see the knife, you anticipate it by five frames, like bah! like that. And then the knife comes out. So you already get people's attention, like, oh shit, what's gonna happen now? <laughs> and then somebody gets their throat slashed or, or shot or, so that's the, and it's so much fun to do that and, and just scare the crap out of people uh, sonically, I guess you could say. For anybody that's listening, there's the, there's the uh, answer on how you scare people with horror music. Your low brooding synth lines and inner voices, that cue, you know, where obviously he's kind of hearing stuff in his head, are incredibly tense and powerful. It's amazing how less, like less notes, less can be so much more in a film like Maniac. Uh, obviously, John Carpenter's proven that with scores like Halloween, The Fog, you know, mm -hmm. Prince of Darkness, Christine. How do you feel about that? Like. Do you feel that music, but do you feel that sometimes you could have less accompaniment, less notes, less going on and still hit the audience the same? In a way, yes. It's 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 really interesting because what it, to your mind and uh, ear, you might think it's just one person holding down a big note and making a low sound. But in actuality, 
it's a whole lot of stuff going going on underneath that spectrum, including I recorded a bunch of bees, like bumblebees, okay? They're subsonic. So when you hear that low, uh, I wish I had my studio here, I would play some stuff for you. But uh, when you hear like that low, what sounds like it's a drone, it's not just one note. It's a combination of frequencies based on what actually form those notes. For example, without getting too physics, if you have a like a bass string and you play a low E on your bass string and halfway up the bass fretboard, you put your finger, you get another E that's, that's a harmonic of that. Well, it goes the other way in reverse. So if you can add a subharmonic below the basic pitch of what you're trying to achieve, you can set up this, this unbelievably low end pitch that's a combination of all the notes, which all the harmonics, I guess you could call them, that help to form that frequency. Every summer, I, well, I don't do it now, but I used to do this. I would get a classical piece of music and, and, and try to analyze it. The good case was Igor Stravinsky. Listening to the Rite of Spring, I'm trying to write it down and say, okay, that's just this big long note. And then I rent the score and I see what he was doing to make that happen. It's not just one person playing a note. It's like 70 people playing a whole bunch of different notes and using this whole premise, the harmonic series or, or how harmonics work to, to generate what normal ear hears as a single pitch. So maybe this is going a little deeper than what your audience might want to hear, but it's your title is the Into the Depths or whatever. So we're deep now, bro. It's deep. Okay. We're into like subharmonics and, and bumblebees and, and stuff. And it's, um, it's pretty cool. So with the bumblebees, I have to ask you, was that a choice? Like one of the things I do sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, because just like any technique, if you overuse it, it could wear out its welcome. But sometimes I, I will put things in my movies that aren't noticeable to the naked eye or the ear. For mm -hmm. example, a guy could be walking on a floor and underneath that w steps, I might actually put some words. Uh -huh. You won't notice. But I'm okay. doing it to give you an effect that it affects the viewer. Mm -hmm. And I don't, like I said, I don't do it all the time. I have right. a movie coming out next month called Devil's Five. It's a horror film, one best horror film about three years ago, scene where a girl is going on a geocache, which mm -hmm. is a smartphone scavenger hunt. And there's a spot where I wanted to leave a clue for someone that might really be paying attention. What's behind this scavenger hunt is mm -hmm. not good. So, so, so were you doing that with the bees? Like, did you know that the bees, the sound of the bee would make people uncomfortable and put them on the edge of their seat? to become suspense? Is that why you were using that technique? It's it's called psychoacoustic. It's like the way it works is that you, you sort of set up this timbre of this uncomfortable timbre of like um, a minor second way down low in the electronic orchestra, the bees and synthesizers and whatever. It's uncomfortable, but when it goes on for a, a little while, the audience starts to feel that that's kind of comfortable. They're starting to get used to that. And then, then the fun begins because they're they're kind of lulled into this sort of dissonant security, and then you hit them with a high shrieking thing out of that you <laughs> created, and you scare the bejesus out of them, and it's awesome. And but it's it's all based on psychoacoustics. Really, it really does work, especially if it's played loud, because you know you have that you have the bees and the synthesizer, and then the bass, the fretless bass, is sort of playing around down there. Blah, 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 blah. You know, after about 30 seconds of that, you get lulled into this, yeah, okay, so now what are they going to do? And then you hit him with something big. Because, you know, what? one thing I would say about Maniac Score, from the first time I saw the movie, it's one of the movies, which is something I always hope for in my own movies, is that you could feel it. You What, what you were doing compositionally and with what you recorded, I could actually feel the movie. And, and you don't always feel scary movies, and you should. And Maniac, you could feel it. Well, you know, whether I understood what you were doing or even was aware of it, I could feel the sensation of what it was giving me as a viewer. Cool. That's good. Well, I, I do the same thing when, like, if I go to see, um, well, not even see, if I hear a John Williams score, for example, I don't feel like I have to go to see the movie because he's told me the movie through his music. So some, some people can figure that out and, and others 
Well, there's chaos. <laughs> there, there's an amazing juxtaposition of music that you bring to the beginning of Maniac Strikes Back. The okay. softness of the first part with that soft keyboard that kind of highlights the recorder. Mm -hmm. It makes the scary music that follows to me even more frightening, obviously because of those two contrasts. I don't. I think that some of the most composers, filmmakers don't even understand. They're not aware of it. I think you need both sides to make it work effectively. What instrument did you use at the start of you know, the disco boy and the girl go park under the Barons on a bridge right well, before right. he's going to get shot? And then right. Frank's car comes up and he shuts off the lights. And yeah. there's like this jangling kind yeah. of jarring. What is that? That's a whole bunch of combination of percussion instruments. Um, beep, beep, beep. The title of the cue is Blast Him, Blast Her or something like yes, that. Yes, that's yeah. it. Interestingly enough, that that was all synthetic and percussion. Part of that sound was a hotel key, room key, inside of a grand piano, scraping the string, recording it while you're changing the pitch. Am I giving away all my secrets here? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Those cues were both licensed to be reused. Pol Poltergeist, the remake of Poltergeist. Apparently, the director wanted that sound, and the composer tried to do it, and they didn't like the sound, so they actually licensed that piece of music from Maniac to use in Poltergeist. But you, you know, on that subject, the instruments that we used, now everything is so digital and digitized, you know, 64-bit and all this. The highest resolution we had were, was like 8-bit instruments, which means the, the, the waveforms were very jagged and this. So you could get sounds out of those instruments like you can't really even if you sample them digitally now, you can't get them to sound the same. It's not the yeah. same technique. I, I, I was going to ask you, in this digital world, do you think that it's as good as some of the stuff you used to record in an analog setting that were real people performing real instruments instead of all this artificial stuff? Of course, so much now is done digitally for budget, budgetary reasons. and. Um, the way analog really works, it's the same if you record analog, and we've experimented with this. Recording analog on a, on a very high-end machine versus a, a very good digital machine, there's something about the analog technology that just sounds different. I can't say it's better or worse. Why maybe a lot of people are going back to... Um, to LPs, you know, and they want to get that, sc that scratchy sound of, of the needle touching the vinyl and making something that the digital technology just can't reproduce. I'm not sure. I mean, there's some amazing things we can do now, both digitally, um, visually, and musically and sound effect wise. I kept all my analog instruments. I still have them. <laughs> so even if you take a, like a mini Moog synthesizer and sample it, and try to play them back to back, the original sound is gonna sound better. It's making, it's what I was talking about before, it's making the harmonics speak in harmonic language, whereas the digital format doesn't recognize that. The digital says, digital zeros and ones, that's all it is. And it's making a, rep, a replica of what they think, or it thinks, that the whole analog waveform was about. We're getting into deep stuff here, my friend, so. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, speaking of deep, the low gyrating synth line in Blast Me, which I know we're just talking about, for me, it's so tactile. Feel it, it's 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 almost like off, comes out of the screen, yeah. touches you. I'll be honest, as a teenager, I was so enthralled with Savini's effect. Watch that scene, I can't tell you how many times, I watched it in slow motion, even though I know part of it's already in slow motion. I watched it in slow motion. I tried to take pictures of it with with back with 110. Remember the 110 cameras? Yeah. In Subway Terror, piano notes, and I think you might have already explained this, they seem to go off key and they change like bending. And then it gives it this really creepy sound. And then the drums and percussion come in and you have that kind of electronic part that kind of bounces around, almost sounds like it's running, almost like the girl. That's pretty amazing the way you put that together. Well, thank you. Again, we we use the, the piano record, it's an acoustic piano, so you can play chords and stuff on it. When you change the pitch of the recording machine, it's gonna bend all that together. So nowadays you can do that on a synthesizer, just play a chord and push a little modulation wheel and it changes. But this way you hit a chord on the piano, 
you turn the little rheostat on the machine and suddenly the whole piano's like bent. It's like one of those paintings where the time is falling off the table, you know? It's like, if you notice the drums were not pitch changing, they were, I mean, they were boop, 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 but they, we did not affect pitch of the drums while the piano was being bent. So the mind like tries to figure out what the heck is going on? How can that piano, or, and sometimes it's an electric piano, be that so far out of tune, but the drums are kind of constant. To be honest, a lot of this was total experimentation. So we didn't know what the heck we were doing, all right? <laughs> But it, it worked, and like, and Bill would come to the session. He didn't come much. He he would come, and he'd hear some stuff. He'd say, oh, that's great! Let's do more of that. You know, he's so Yahoo kind of a guy. I love that higher registered keyboard line in "Goodbye Rita." It correlates with the droning keyboard. It really sounds kind of gothic. Like, yeah, that's a. Um, all that was was a, a Fender Rhodes called a suitcase piano, and it has a um, kind of like a ring modulator effect to it, but it. Nowadays, they would call it flanging, where a piece of outboard equipment in the in the studio sort of takes that sound, doubles it, but not exactly at the same pitch. If I play a C on the piano, the flanger will maybe make it like a bit like a C sharp, but it does it sort of automatically, and and it's based on the harmonics that are being produced, and so it's sort of out of your control, but we kind of experimented with what, what little resources we had. And, and the same thing with um, what's called delay. Delay, when you mix the music down from the 24 track machine, you have a little space when you mix it down to, I think we mix it down to four tracks. There's a, you can offset each track just a little bit more. So it sort of sounds like it's more complicated than what you actually played. Now you can do that digitally like pushing a button in the days before uh, midi or or synchronization you had to you had to use what you could find is that, is that a clarinet in cry for mother no it's a um it was one of the woodwinds that, that george played it might have just been a, some special kind of a flute but it okay. had a little re reedy kind of a sound to it yeah it's really it's really nice because it gave it a real emotional foundation Right. Uh, especially before that carnage comes after. <laughs> that's how the score and that's how the movie worked. If you notice, like Bill would do these things, like he's crying over his mother's grave and everything, and you're feeling kind of pathos, and then she pops out of the grave, you know, like, wow. And you don't expect that, you know? It's like, I mean, I guess most horror movies, you have one of those scenes, but I didn't expect that when I saw it. It scared me a lot. Yeah, it's, and, kind, of, it's kind of what filmmakers call misdirection. Yeah. You know, you make the audience think one thing and give them the opposite. Yeah. And you know, you know about the name, right? Um, the Zito name. You know how that, that came How did about. that, how did the, how did that Zito name come? Well, the still photographer on the film was Bobby Lee Zito, who Joe Zito's wife, you know, was a friend of Bill's. So that was sort of homage to, to that. And there might be more to it than that, but that was a sort of another inside sort of. And then story. you ended up working with Joe Zito on a couple films. Yeah, I've done like four or five films for him, yeah. The New, well, you were part of the New York scene. Like, everybody's like, oh, I have to go to Hollywood and make movies. And no, it's like, it was so, I don't want to say easy. It was such a good community, a, the film community in New York. And maybe it's not the same now, but it was a very tight bunch of people that were working. So the editors, sound editors, you know, I know a lot of it's changing now. I just read that sound, sound one is no longer there. But no, you do a film, and the editor on a film would maybe move up to another level of film and he'd say, oh, I know somebody that might be good for the music on this. And then he'd call me and that level of film was up, you know, a little higher budget and um, and that's how it worked. I, I, I would hope it's like that because I think that we shouldn't, as we meaning filmmakers, shouldn't compete. I think we should help each other out because that's kind of what makes the world a better place. There's no sure. reason for infighting or trying to compete I've never thought that that was productive. I think if you could help, look, I've had a couple guys ask me to help them with films, whether mm -hmm. it was find actors, locations, and right. every and, and the movie coming out next month, Devil's Five. You know, the other thing too, in New York, you walked down the street and you'd see everybody, you know, like, well, I'm gonna go over to 42nd Street or 47th of the editing room. In, in LA, you gotta get in a car and drive two hours, to, you know, <laughs> have a meeting. And it's like, but you know, everybody that I talk to and I, when I teach and stuff is like, no, go to New York. I mean, there's a lot of stuff happening. I, I hope there still is. Um, you know, I don't think you have to be in 
in a mecca like like LA or or Hollywood to get your stuff done. You know, you have, might have to go to meetings, but now we're doing a meeting. We're not very close together, so you know, it works out. Exactly, and and, and I'll be honest with you completely. I actually think that if you're from some place that's different, that we don't always see, mm -hmm. that as a low budget or independent filmmaker, that's an advantage. Because yes. if you try to go where all the big guys are with bigger budgets and more people working, you're just going to fall into the, you know, you're going to get lost. If you're Toby Hooper and you shoot Chainsaw in Texas, if you're Sam Raimi and shoot Evil Dead in Tennessee, mm -hmm. right. or Bill Lustig shooting Maniac in New York, on a kind of part of New York we don't normally see, right? That right. that's an advantage. I think that's it's a it's a calling card. Well, exactly. Like like some of the shows, like Ozark, for example. I mean, the fact is, people want to see something different than than New York and and Hollywood. And so now you're uh, in in the Ozark. It just looks different, and so the people sound different. And it's like it's refreshing. And like same thing with Breaking Bad. That was done in New Mexico, uh, Albuquerque area, and that looked different. You couldn't get that kind of light in New York or in L.A. I, yeah, I agree completely. So I'm curious, when you were creating the score for Maniac, how, how long did it take to do it? Not that long. I'd say maybe three weeks at the most, from conception to... And the only reason it took that long was that we had to do it quick one note at a time. But I generally would, would write it. It was all written out. I mean... There, there's sheet music for every piece of music, but a lot of it was, we'd go to the studio and pass it out and experiment. It was pretty cool because we sort of had the studio blocked out. There wasn't anybody else there for like a week and a half when we were making the score in the studio. Whereas now, if you do a big, uh, big studio picture, you've got a big room that you're paying thousand dollars an hour for with a big orchestra, you can't mess around that much. You know, you've got a certain amount of time because the clock is ticking. With these guys, I said, look, here's all I have to pay. I want to do something different so we can all collaborate here. And and so they did. It was like a very, it was fun. I mean, everybody, we bought lunch and hung out. Bill came and it was like a lot of fun. At any point when you were listening to what you were recording, what you had written already, obviously. Did it ever give you the creep? Like, were you trying to scare yourself? Like, did you ever get the heebie-jeebies or get kind of creeped out by what you were hearing coming back? Well, usually it, it came back a little creepier than what I imagined, but I have to share this one little story in that at the time I was writing this, my daughter was maybe five or six years old living. We're having dinner and she said, well, what are you doing after dinner, daddy? I said, well, I have to go in and kill Rita. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that gave me the creeps pretty pretty much. But in terms of hearing the music, uh, because we never, actually nobody had really done much of the kind of music that we did in the score before. So everything we did was like, we're all kind of looking at each other and said, wow, that's pretty cool. I don't know that it creeped us out because the movie kind of creeped us out <laughs> without the music, you know? <laughs> um, uh, I, I just never saw a movie like that before. So, but we weren't, as I said, we weren't watching the movie when we scored it. We just were making the music and then we'd go to the editing room and the mix. And that's when we finally saw what it really looked like together. And everybody was pretty impressed. They said, well, how did you do that? You know, because there wasn't, wasn't much, I don't even know what the budget was, but it was not very much. But we all came out of it okay. And everybody got was happy with it and um, went on to be pretty successful. So, so out of your whole career, and obviously you've done much bigger things since then, how do you look at Maniac out of all the feathers in your cap? How do you look at that score within your career? Well, it has to be the most important because it was the first real score of my own music. So if I had I not done that score, or if that score was a complete failure, I doubt if I would have climb the ladder sense of um of how people communicated i give bill so much credit for my career and of course we worked together on many other films he taught me how to do it showed me how he wanted it to be done and without ever talking about g sharp or e flat or anything he just had these reactions when he really liked something when he didn't like something he just got really quiet so <laughs> Which for Bill, that's quite a statement. Vigilante, Maniac Cop, 
Maniac Cop 2, Relentless. You've done a bunch of other films for Bill. You know, just briefly, has your working relationship remained the same? Meaning, does he leave you alone and let you create? Or does he give you more notes now, more reference? Or because it worked so good the first time, have you retained that? Well, each each one of those films was a little different. So I guess Vigilante, he was a little more hands-on because he he saw that as a true urban Western, which is why... We had cars and, and it sounded like a Western. I mean, but after that, he would pretty much say, you know what to do. When we did Maniac Cop, the thing with the whistling thing, he said, how'd you ever think of that? I said, well, I just thought of it. And he says, well, that was brilliant. I wish there were more directors that would let the people do what they really are trained to do. Because now, no offense, you're a director and do a lot of other things. It's so hard when, when people like literally move in to your studio, I mean, permanently, and want to experiment with every little note, and then it becomes, it's not spontaneous anymore. It's sort of like committee. The idea of not doing temp scores, Bill didn't temp any of the movies that I worked on, as far as I know. He said, no, just, you know, score the movie. <laughs> and yeah. sometimes he came, he didn't come to that many recording sessions, really. Wow. He didn't, he wasn't that critical until he heard the music finish. Then he might move stuff around here and there, or maybe ask for a couple little things to be different, but not, not much. I mean, compared to how it, it's progressed in other people and other genres, it's like, you better, uh, you better have thick skin because everybody's telling you how to do it. Yeah. Not- you know, I, I try my best with the composers I work with. I try my best to give them some kind of a little bit of a blueprint, a reference score. I don't give them music, but I'll I'll say, you know, if you listen to this and maybe that, if you could get in a ballpark, but, but I always say to them, make it your own. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and sometimes they come back with stuff very close. Other times they come back with something totally different. I worked with the three composers on Devils Five. I purposely wanted three different guys. So right. they'd be three different fields. One guy I chose him because I knew he would do something very unorthodox, totally unique. He's a guitar player. Okay. So, but you know, he could create music with keyboards and stuff too. So his name is Jeff Tyson and he was taught by Joe Satriani. I knew Jeff would be different. And then with, with say the guy who did the wraparound, which we called the Devil's Five, I wanted someone that sounded like very traditional classic in orchestration. Mm-hmm. It used like a bigger brass and, horns right. and strings and stuff right. and then when i did abandon i thought i'd go with some guy who was more like ambient electronic mm-hmm. which was david helpland when you see the movie they do have different feels yeah so I, I do try to leave them alone as much as i'm definitely never there well the fact is uh jeff was in prague asim who did the devil's five is in turkey right david's in san diego and i'm in long island after i graduated high school which was 1984 so i guess about four years after maniac came out i had a graduation party at my house Mm -hmm. and i was the type of guy maybe not dissimilar to you in a way where i wasn't a um party guy never smoked a cigarette my whole life never tried a drug even marijuana Mm -hmm. so i come from a very straight list background but i've been a whore freak since i was a kid Really? Yeah. So my party was a bunch of people coming from actually two high schools that I'd gone to because we moved halfway through my high school time. Mm -hmm. And guess what we did all night for my party? From 9 p.m. to about 7 a.m., we watched five horror films. Really? It was Scanners, Dawn of the Dead, Creepshow, Halloween 2, and Maniac. Oh. And I don't mean that order, but those were the five films. There was a couple of girls, but it was mostly guys. Yeah. We were in the basement of my house in Sohomish. That tells you how important the movie was to me. I had to play at my graduation party and I've been a huge fan ever since. So all I can say, I I consider Maniac in, if you break down the subcategories of horror films, best horror film ever made, gore, best horror film ever made. If you consider just horror film, it's one of the best horror films ever made easily. Excellent. Well, Bill would love to hear that. And uh, and I'll, I'll talk to him and see how we can hook you guys up. And who knows, maybe he'll be your next guest. That's amazing. Well, thank you for all your time. Thank Jay. you. <laughs> Jay, ho- hopefully I've uh, dug a little deeper than the usual guy. Oh, yeah, for sure. This is pretty deep. So uh, you might get some uh, 
I don't know, some psychoacoustic interest in the, <laughs> playing this stuff. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I, I hope I didn't give away all my secrets. I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jay, and I appreciate all your time. And okay. br brilliant job. Keep up the good work. Okay. All right. You take care. Okay. Right. Good night. Bye -bye. <laughs>